This is the Commission Church Online. Welcome to our podcast. We want to be a church who brings heaven on earth through the word of God and the love of Christ. I pray this week's message blesses you. Hey, I want to jump right into the word of God. Is that okay? Uh, I want to share a word that God has put on my heart for this launch Sunday. Uh, a few few weeks ago, I think it was four weeks ago, we took a break from our regular series that we do uh, at, at Commission Church. We do a expository study kind of a thing where we go through books of the Bible and we study verse, for, verse, ver, verse after verse, break it down, and we study the word for what it is. Uh, but... Uh, we take a break between series just to do some stand- standalone messages and hearing from God what he has in store for this season. And I can't wait to share with y'all that word that God has put on my heart. For those of y'all who don't know me, my name is Ashish. I get to serve here uh, on, the, on the team here at, at Commission and uh, with these amazing, amazing people here that make sure that we live out the vision that God has entrusted us with is, uh, is taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to all the ends of the world and, and we start with our own city. And uh, I thank God for placing us here and, and we're excited for this new chapter uh, in our church's history. Uh, we have lunch at after service, so don't worry about going back home and, and cooking or going and looking for restaurants on your phone during service, all right? Like, I'll spare you of that. We have an amazing barbecue lunch uh, for those of you guys who, uh, uh, who, who love barbecue, and for those of you all who are vegan, God bless you. Um, I'll pray for you after service. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. We have some vegan options for you guys as well. But man, it's going to be great. We're going to have an amazing time of fellowship after service. Uh, I want to title my message this morning, Labels. I want to title my message this morning, Labels. We're going to talk about how God tasks us with replacing the facts of life with the truth that is mentioned to us in the Word of God. All right? Uh, For the rest of your life, if you haven't experienced it till today, literally for the rest of your life, people will be trying to find words to describe you. They will try to put you in boxes. They will try to describe you in different ways and forms. Uh, They will try to sum you up and categorize you because that's what we do. Human beings label things. It got pretty bright in here, right? All right. (laughs) That's what human beings do. We label people. If you ask me what the labels I have that I put on myself, I'm a, uh, I call myself a book junkie. I, uh, I'm a sports lover. Uh, I, I, I'm a coffee snoob. Somebody yesterday called me a nerd. Uh, I'll take that. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, and, and I've got no problems with these labels. They kind of represent a part of who I am. They're not who I am, but they represent a part of who I am. And you probably have a number of these labels yourself, right? Uh, They're they're plastered on your forehead as well. Some of y'all like those labels, some of y'all don't. I challenge you, if you have to look back into your middle school years or your high school years, and if I ask you, hey, can you think of a label that you had growing up in middle school or high school, what would that label be? Come on, just shout it out. Nobody, nobody had labels. Amazing childhood, wow. What's that? Band geek? Wow, okay. Band geek? Anything else? I'm sorry, what? Stud? Is that what you said? (laughs) Gary, always with the jokes. There you go. Anybody else? Come on, man. It can't just be two people with labels. Anybody else? No labels? Y'all had an amazing upbringing, man. Because if you were like me, I got fat. All right? I don't complain about it because the Bible says the fat is the Lord's. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I got ugly. I got poor. I got loser. I got skinny. No, just kidding. I never got skinny, but a lot of y'all probably have got that. And if you got that, it's not a negative thing. I pray for that every single day. So embrace it. Say thank you, Jesus, for that. Poor kid is what I got. Good for nothing is what I got. My economics teacher called me that. In 11th grade, she said, I will amount to nothing in my life. I I thank God for God. Amen. That proves every human being wrong. And as you get older, it's other labels 
Labels that your spouse puts on you, labels that your boss puts on you, or your friends put on you, or your coaches put on you, and they stick. They have a tendency to stick. And as you go through different phases of your life, those labels turn into divorced or addict or bankrupt or jobless or I can go on and on and on. And then for some other people, those are genetic labels. There's heart disease. And some of you all claim that on your lives and say, hey, man, my dad and my grandfather, we talked about that a few weeks ago. Uh, people in my family all have a heart disease. So I want to make sure that I take all the precautions I can take in order to not ha have that happen to me. Cancer runs in my family. We allow genetics to label us. But here's the thing, but the solid, firm, biblical reality is that we are not our labels. I want to remind somebody here today, you are not your labels. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, I want you to turn your Bibles with me. And if you're taking notes, take good notes. It's going to be a good message this morning. For Paul, there was only one label that mattered, right? And I want you to, I want you to read that verse with me. The Bible says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. But it is Christ who lives in me. When Paul said that he had been crucified with Christ, he meant that his old, sinfully enslaved, his wickedness-loving self had been killed. That's what he meant. It was crucified when Christ died. When Paul's old self died, all the labels that went along with his old self also died. Am I talking to somebody today? Paul was a violent man. But the violent label was nailed to the cross the moment Jesus was nailed to the cross. That's what Paul is trying to say. Paul was a self-righteous man, but the self-righteous label was pinned to the cross. That label was taken off of him and put on the cross of Jesus Christ the moment Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. So that's what Paul means by saying, I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives inside of me. Here's the thing, human labels may, may be a fact of life, but they don't have to be, they don't have to rule our life. They can be a part of your life, they can, they, they, they can, they can play a role in your life here and there, but it does not have to be where they rule your life, because fact does not equate faith. It does not equate truth. They're polar opposites. The fact is that you and I may deserve to be called those labels, but the truth is that God has called you by name and said, I died on the cross for you. I took that shame. I took that pain. I took that label. So you don't have to live in shame, in iniquity, in those things that you, you live in and wallow in. You don't have to do that is what God is trying to remind us this morning. For Paul, it was one label that mattered. Christ lives in me. That's all he was care that, that's all he cared about. The reality defined who he was. The old labeled Paul had been crucified with Christ, and the new Paul had only one label, and that label read Christ inside of me. Jesus at the center of it all. That's what it read. When you look at me, you don't look at the old Oshish. You don't look at what people call me and told me about before. Christ walked into my life, and the day he walked into my life, man, it was amazing. He changed every single thing about me and if you've been there somebody say amen. amen so this morning we're about to learn about a man like Paul who was marred with a label that he actually grew tired of and he decided to do something about it I don't know but God is probably talking to some people here that are probably tired of the labels that have been put on you the labels that you have put on yourself, the self-inflicted labels, the ones that have been pasted on you, and no matter how much you try to take them off, and no matter, you know how, how labels work, they, they fall off after some time. It's only so much it sticks. It's not like super glue or anything, but the, the, the matter of fact is every time it falls on, we have a tendency to take it and put it back up. There are people around us all the time that have a tendency to pick up those labels and stick it back up saying, hey, you dropped something. And oftentimes we get caught up in that whole cycle of being reminded. And in First Chronicles chapter number 4, we're about to learn about this man called Jabez. In First Chronicles 4, go with me there, in verse number 9 and 10, we're going to read two verses and we're going to break this down. Is that cool? Say yes. <laughs> verse number 9, the Bible says this, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. 
Verse 10, Jabez prayed to the God of Israel. He wanted to do something about this. He said, man, I'm grown up. I've been living with this title, this, this thing for way too long. And he said, I don't want to do this anymore. Jabez prayed to the God of Israel saying, oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory and that your hand might be with me and that you would keep me away from harm so that it might not bring me pain. And this is the beautiful thing. And God granted what he asked. Amen. Oh, come on, somebody. Can I pray over this word? Father, would you speak to us through this word? Yes, Lord, I pray that this word will be life-changing, life-transforming. Yes, I pray that you will speak to somebody this morning, and I pray that lives will be changed. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, amen. amen. The writer of the book of 1 Chronicles, Ezra, is using a bunch of chapters from chapter number 1 to chapter number 9 to do some name-calling. He is... Uh, He's chronicling the the children of Israel in the first nine chapters, around 600 names you will find in there. If you've ever done a Bible plan reading, how many of y'all do that? The New Year decisions, you say, I'm going to follow a Bible plan. January 1st, you're good. January 2nd, you're good. January 3rd, uh, yeah, I'll I'll do it tomorrow. January 4th, you're like, "Ah, let me do yesterday, today, and then let me sleep in. And, And then January 10th, you don't have a Bible plan anymore. Come on, somebody. Anybody been there? But for those of y'all who want to fall asleep and who have a hard time falling asleep, First Chronicles is a great place to start because the moment you start reading First Chronicles 1, it's these names and this person begat this person and this person was so-and-so's baby daddy and this person was this and this and this and this was this long list of men and women. That, that begat somebody, this person and that person, and this person was childless, and this person was fatherless, and this person was then this person. Am, am I talking to somebody? So this huge list of people. So among these names over nine chapters, in chapter number four, out of nowhere, Ezra takes a pause. He takes a break to do a very noble mention of a name. And in chapter number four, he pauses over there in verse number nine. And he was like, this person, this person, this person, this person. And by the way, guys, let me pause here to give a very noteworthy mention to this man called Jabez. This is beautiful because he's not done this before. And he says, I need to talk about this guy. There's this guy that, that, that matters and right in the middle of chapter four, it's like the Holy Spirit illuminates his mind. And he said, let me tell you about this guy real quick. He's a guy that that got a hold of God, that challenged God, that prayed a prayer that was simple yet powerful, and God changed his life forever. I want to be a person like that. That, 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 that comes in between history. When people are going through names, I want to be that name, Andrew, that people pause and say, let me talk about Ashish for just a second. Come on, somebody. Let me tell you that because he was a prayerful man, because he was a man of God, because he was a man after God's own heart, this and this and this and this happened. I challenge that some of y'all need to be people that are history changers. Don't just be another name in the book. I pray that people will pause when they hear about your name because I pray that we will have encounters with God that are worthy of notable mention. Amen. I want to be known somewhere in history as someone who got a hold of God and my destiny was sealed. We're going to talk about how to replace the facts of life with the truth of God. You know what the fact of life was? The fact of life was Jabez was born under circumstances under his control. It was undeniable. I didn't do anything about this. I I don't know how I got here. His mom names him painful, but God calls him honorable. All right. I need you to journey with me as we go through this. What people are speaking over you and what God is saying about you are two different things. As Christians and believers, it's so important for us to understand that. Jabez's mom names them based on her experience, not his. Labels often creep up based on experiences beyond your control sometimes. Names were this big deal in the Bible. They named kids based on life experiences. When Hannah was praying for a child and she didn't have a child for a long time and God gives her a child, she names him Samuel and he says, because God has heard my prayer, his name is Samuel. So when this child was born, she went through so much of pain that he said, oh, I'm going to call you pain. 
I don't care what your friends call you. I don't care if you get ridiculed. I don't care if you get mocked. I don't think she was thinking about any of that stuff. I don't care. She was thinking about the Starbucks person that's going to say, hey, what is your name? What name is on the order? Jabez Payne? What? She wasn't thinking about the kid in school that, that was going to bully Jabez. No, no, no. None of that stuff mattered to her. She named him based on her experiences. Kids now get trendy names like North <laughs> and West and Apple. Or Ashish. <laughs> a lot of people don't know how to say my name. My name is Ah and then Shish. My last name is Matthew, so that's my saving grace. But it's Matthew with, a, with one T, so that's, that's, that's bad. Everyone's like, how do you say that? Matthew, it's, it's just one T, but it's Matthew. So when I go to Starbucks, my name is Matt. All right? My name is Matt because no one can get Matt wrong. Last week, I went and got my Starbucks from the window, and the label said Pat. <laughs> I was like, really, is it that, like, is it that? <laughs> See, names back in the Old Testament were a prediction of the future, a declaration of your character and a prophecy about where you were going. That's what names were. They were of value. You couldn't just go into the court and say, I'm not happy with my name. I want to change my name from Kanye to Ye. You just couldn't do that. You know what I'm saying? That, that wasn't a thing because your father or your mother blessed you and that was a blessing. Usually the blessing would go to where they would get on their knees. Both of them would get on their knees. They would look at each other and they would bless them, hold hands, and they would bless the person they were blessing. When a father would name the child, he would go on his knees. He would hold the, the child in his knees and he would speak life over the child and name the child. But the Bible says in her pain... In her suffering, the mother named her son what she was going through. In this case, there was pain involved. A lot of grief. It was probably a dysfunctional family. It, it was, he was probably a specially able child. We don't know. He was probably physically disabled because these are the labels that we often get in our circles, in our lives, in, in the people that we know, in our families, in our own kids. But all we know is that some sorrow surrounded his existence. She said, your name is painful because she named his future based on her past. She named his destiny based on her history. See, here's the thing I want to remind you, church. You will allow people to label you and name you throughout the course of your life if you are not careful. They don't know who you are and whose you are, but they think that they can name you. You're going to encounter so many of those in your life. I got to be careful to not let people name me based on their experience. It's easy to allow people and their decisions to make you declare facts over your own life. I still remember when Sonia and I got engaged uh, around eight years ago. Uh, we were preparing for marriage and you always have those people that come and they give you their two cents about marriage. Oh, you're engaged. Marriage. <laughs> you ready? I guess. I'm like, for what? Like, I, I thought marriage was amazing. I heard. No, I don't know. I don't know about all that. You ready? Run away if you can. <laughs> seven, years in, seven years later, man, I, I love being married to the most gorgeous and godly lady ever, and I don't regret my decision. I don't know what you're, you, you and your spouse are going through, but hey, you know what? We have a great thing going. Thank you. <laughs> and then it continues. When we were pregnant with our first child, when we, we were pregnant with Michaela, they come back again. It's the same people. Oh, you ready? <laughs> you ready? You ready? I'm like, I, yeah, I, I guess. I'm, I mean, ready or not, here it comes, you know? I mean, it's not like I could be like, God, is there a return policy? No. I'm ready. Oh, say goodbye to sleep. Oh. I'm like, I understand that. But man, five years later, man, I, I have two girls on either side of me, in my arms, in my bed, sleeping. And I enjoy every moment of my wake. Come on, somebody. It is enjoyable. It is wonderful. Yeah, my, my, my arms are numb in the morning and I can't feel them. But it's enjoyable nonetheless. I don't know what labels, I don't know what you've been through in my life, and, and you probably have. You pro, you pro, your kids probably didn't turn out. Okay, it's fine, it's whatever, but I'm not going to claim that over my life. That's 
What names have you taken on? What names have you accepted willingly or unwillingly? Volitionally or unvolitionally? Like, like what labels have you willingly taken on? How many labels have stuck even though you protested? Imagine growing up with a name like that, but this Jabez refused to wear the loser label, and you should too this morning. If you are there, if you were in some kind of situation where you feel like you've been labeled, you've been going through the motions of life where you've been labeled, God is looking at some of y'all and saying, you need to get tired of that. Jabez wouldn't let his beginnings dictate his end. He refused to allow his family to keep him down and, 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 and bind him and, and put him in boundaries. So after we're introduced to the label Jabez, then we're introduced to the Jabez who decided to rip that label off and choose God's label instead. You ready for this Jabez? Because when one label was what people put on Jabez, there were other labels that he said, you know what? I need to take this upon myself because I need to do something about this. How did he choose truth over fact? A very simple answer in one, one phrase. He prayed. Amen. How many of y'all believe in prayer here? Come on, somebody. Amen. Wednesday, we prayed in this place. You remember that, Chris? We were here. We prayed. Powerful things started happening. Come on, somebody. Like, like we prayed for, 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 for multiple people. We prayed for Alyssa, who was really sick, and she was, she, she was miserable. We prayed for her. We declared God's victory over her life, and she messaged right after we finished service, and she said, I'm feeling so much more better. Come on, somebody. She said, I'm healed. I'm completely healed. We prayed for David. David was on four, four liters of ox, five liters of ox, four liters, something like that, and he's down to three liters right now. Oh, I don't know. Come on. Come on. Give God a mighty hand. We believe in prayer. We pray everywhere. We pray right before the sermon. We pray before the service. We pray after the worship is done. We pray everywhere. We, we, we pray as much as we can. We have a prayer team available because we believe that God answers prayers. Hallelujah. We're, not, we're not doing simple prayers. Lord, would you just be here? Lord. Here we are. No, we don't, we don't play simple. You know what I'm saying? Like, we ask mountains to move. Yes. Hallelujah. Come on. We, we ask valleys to be, come on, plain. There, there's, there's things that we put into motion that we believe that when we declare, things can happen. And he chose to pray. And in verse number 10, the Bible says, Jabez prayed to the God of Israel. Amen. I want to leave a few points with you. Is that cool? A few points. Point number one. What did he choose? He chose blessing. He chose blessing. He got tired of his circumstances and he chose blessing. How are you going to choose truth over fact? Because facts are things that people can throw at you based on exactly what they see. Facts are sometimes undeniable because that's exactly what you're going through and they're they're probably right. But the truth of the fact is a different one. It's hidden. They can't see that. And truth is often things that the the, the truth is is, is always more powerful than facts are because because truth will always outweigh and, and overshadow facts. He chose blessing. Verse number 10, Jabez prayed to the God of Israel saying, oh, that you would bless me indeed. Before I talk about bless, blessing, he says indeed. The word indeed over there is literally translated, God, would you bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me. Or in other words, would you bless me big time? Come on. Am I talking to somebody here? That was, that was what we used to say back then, big time. I don't know what the kids do nowadays. They, they have weird names, weird words. But man, God is a God of blessing. Is that okay to say? God is a God of blessing. Like people get weirded out. The reason I asked was people get weirded out. The moment you say, you talk about blessing, you can talk about deliverance and breakthrough and all of that, but don't talk about blessing, pastor, because you know what? That's prosperity. I want to go there. You don't have to get weirded out about blessing. Because blessing is, or sometimes I feel like we're so blessed that we don't need any more blessing. Like we, we feel weird asking God to bless already something that's blessed. But Jabe is like, no, Lord, I need your blessing. Like I, I definitely need your blessing. He remembered his ancestor Abraham when, when the Lord said to him, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be, come on, somebody. Those names are big, blessing, and great, and bless you, and a great nation. Yes, hallelujah. That's what he prayed for. But like I said before, let me backtrack. The text is funny because it says his mother named him. You know, in the Old Testament times, funny because in the Old Testament times, fathers usually named the sons. 
Mom was angry and upset, and she names him Jabez. I don't know what she's going through. I don't know what life circumstances are, but she calls him pain. You know, that's when dad, you should have stepped in. Am I talking to somebody? That's when you should have stepped in and said, so, babe, I think we should take some time to think about this. <laughs> babe, I think uh, the meds are still wearing off. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, babe, I think we need to get some food in your system, some water in your system. Maybe we need to get that rest that the doctor advised before we decide some names. Because in Genesis 35, something like that happens. You know, when Rachel delivers her baby, she dies out of childbirth, right? It's a very sad story, but she dies out of childbirth, and she names her son Benomi, which means son of sorrow, because she went through so much of pain during the last nine months till the point of childbirth. So she says, man, this is what's on my mind. I'm going to give you exactly what's on my mind. She calls him Benomi. That's what you're going to be called. Every single waking moment of the day, I'm going to remind you of how much pain you caused me. Come on, somebody. Any moms like that over here? I hope not. But she dies out of childbirth. Her dad steps right in. His dad steps right in. Jacob steps in, picks him up, and says, I'm going to call you Benjamin. Changes his name and says, I'm going to call you Benjamin. A father who stood up for his son. How many of you have allowed labels to stick because you're hurt that people that should have defended you actually chickened out? Am I talking to somebody here? There are so many people that get hurt because people that were supposed to stand up for you, people that were supposed to strip those labels for you, people that had to come in the way of people throwing labels at you did not come through for you. No one here? Me. I got bullied in school because I used to stutter. I couldn't go through one sentence without saying, lion. I couldn't. I had a best friend that was so loyal that he would ask people to actually back off. I was so happy because any time you saw me, I was with him because he was always, always my defender because I couldn't speak up for myself. But amazing is one day he flipped. He flips one day. He joins them in laughing at me and I'm hurt. I'm broken. The one that defended me was now the mocker. I don't know how many of y'all have been there in your life. Like how many of of you have been hurt by somebody that should have defended you? Jabez says, my mother cursed me and my father didn't defend me. But I believe that my God is a God of restoration and my God can bless me. Come on, somebody. Somebody needs to say this morning that I serve a God who can bless me. Can I remind somebody today that what God can speak over your life is greater than what anybody has ever spoken or anybody has not spoken over your life. His word is powerful. His word is great. His word is alive. And when you allow his word to be breathed inside of you, amazing, wonderful, beautiful, prosperous things can happen in your life. You probably have a label because somebody spoke over your life. And that label stuck because the people that should have stood up for you and defended you failed to do so. But I'm here to remind you that God can stand up for you despite of the many people that don't stand up in your honor. Jabez says, God, I need you to bless me. I remember saying that prayer. Broken and hurting as a stammer and a stutter. I said, God, I need you to bless me. I can't go on like this. I was a stammerer when God looked at me and said, I want you to be a preacher. I said, "Uh, really, God? Have you seen me? Have you heard me? I said, I am about to be a preacher till you heal me and you bless me. I literally prayed this prayer. I held on to it and said, God, bless me, bless me. How many of you in school were like afraid of reading? Like, that was me. Anytime like the teacher said, can someone read this? I'm like, my pencil fell down. That was me all the time because I didn't want to read. Because every time I read, I stuttered. I was so self-conscious. I was, I was not okay with being who I was. God, heal me. God, heal me from that. God said, you know what? I am a God that can heal you. I don't know what you're going through today. But when you seriously look at God and say, God, I need a blessing. God is able to bless you. God is able to heal you. Amen. Don't be scared to say, God, bless me. Bless my family. Don't be afraid to put your hands on your children and bless them. Say, I bless you, Evelyn. I bless you, Lillian. I bless you, uh, Micah. I bless you, Mikhail. I bless you. Don't be afraid to bless your children day after day. It's important. Here's the fact. They were born in pain. Here's the truth. They were born. He was born in grace. 
Come on, somebody. And because he was born in grace, because Galatians 1 and verse 15 says, but before I was even born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. Come on, can I hear an amen? Jeremiah 1, 5 says, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. That is the truth, and the truth will always win. No matter what label has been put upon you, Jabez says, God, your word, your promise, your truth is more bigger and mightier than any name or anything that anybody can label and put over me. I claim the blessing of God. He said, God bless me. Amen. Someone say, God bless me. God bless me. How did he flip the script? He chose, the second thing is he chose honor. First thing he chose blessing. The second one is he chose honor. But here's the key. We find it in the first part of the verse where Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. That's what the Bible says. Despite of his condition, despite of his name, the Bible says he was more honorable, which means his brothers were honorable, but he was more honorable than his brothers. Like, how can you take somebody seriously with that name? Like, how can somebody seriously look at somebody that's called pain and take them serious and give them honor and respect? How can you build character with a past like that? But he chooses to resolve. He, 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 he resolves to look over that label and to build his character. Here's the thing. The key is character, church. See, honor is associated with character all the time. When character is developed, honor is released. You can't chase after honor. You can work on character. Honor chases after you. Jabez, rather than letting his name determine his destiny, he rose above his name, becoming a man of noble nature. That's what the Bible says. You know what he doesn't? He, he didn't allow the weight of his burden to determine the weight of his character. Never, no matter what you're going through in your life, never allow the weight of your burden to outweigh the weight of your character because your character is what clears the way for God to do what he wants to do in the future. What does that tell me? It tells me that your past does not have, have to determine your future. By giving yourself to God, you can become all that God wants you to be and he wants to make you like him. And he chose character and he chose honor. The third thing is this. He chose growth. Verse 10, the Bible says, Lord, enlarge my territory. Enlarge my territory. Or in other words, literally he's saying, Lord, make me big. I want to break this down for you. I want to break this down for you. The, the, the literal word used over there, the literal translation is, Lord, make me big. All right? Don't get nervous about asking God to enlarge your territory. Now, again, I, I, I want to be very, very clear. This passage does not mean, God, give me more. This passage does not mean, pour it out on me, Lord. I have so much and just keep it coming, Lord. That's not what it means. This isn't a, Jesus, my name is Jimmy, and I'll take all you can give me. That's not what this passage is all about. Clear clarification over here. This is not a prosperity passage of saying, come on, everybody, say I am more than a, I, I, you have all things, go outside, claim a Lamborghini, and a Lamborghini is going to come to your drive. None of that. He says, make me big. He speaks of enlargement in the circle of your influence. In the sphere of your ministry. He talks about responsibility. He's just not talking about money or wealth. He's not talking about homes or cattle. He's talking about, he's talking about more than that. He wanted more influence. He wanted to be an impact. When he spoke, he wanted people to stop and turn their heads. Come on, somebody. When you walk into a room, do people turn their heads or do they look at you? Do, do they, do they walk, or walk away? Do they go into another room? Or do they, do they leave the room altogether? Or do they actually come to you? That's what influence is. That's what big is. When you walk into a place, your, your presence should be felt not because of who you are or not because of your perfume or not because of your cologne or not because of how tall or big and, 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 and large you are. No, because you have this warmth and you have the Holy Spirit inside of you that makes you aware, that makes you present. And when you walk in, you bring God with you. You bring Jesus with you. You bring the Holy Spirit with you to where people cannot help but look and say, wow. Jesus, hallelujah. That's what this is about. 
The idea here is to have a greater impact. He might allow your business, your holdings, it might be your exposure or whatever to grow, but with the idea of using the growing influence to actually influence people for Jesus Christ. Amen. How many of y'all are just okay with being where you are? But, but, and God is challenging some people and saying, no, I want you to be a bigger influence. I want you to be, I, I want your voice to be powerful. I want your social media posts to be powerful. I want you to speak the truth. I want you to be present. And when you are present, I want you to embody Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in everything you say and do. Are you making an impact through your life? You know, there's this popular term in business, and I'm sure you've heard it. It says, think outside the box. And what it means is, think beyond what you have always done or thought about something. For example, there's this guy called Fred Smith. He saw how packages were being delivered, taking many days and weeks to get to their destinations. He decided to think of a way for people to get their stuff, not in a few days, or a couple, not cut those days down. He wanted to do next day, overnight deliveries all around the world. A college professor who looked at his idea, submitted in paper, thought it was a nice idea, but not very practical, so he gave him a C on his paper. Chris is going to get excited in a second. Not very practical, right? Tell that to Fred Smith now. He won't listen because FedEx is a household name. Amen. Come on, somebody. <laughs> he works for FedEx. That's, that's why he got excited over there. Robin, too. See, that's what I mean when I say we need to live big for God. Small li stop sm living small. Stop not making an influence. Stop not making an impact. We need Christians who can rise up to political circles. We need Christian businessmen and businesswomen. We need men and women that are godly, that can stand up, and when they stand up, their voices will be heard. We need Christians that can stand up for social justice issues, that can say, hey, I'm going to make my voice heard, and when I shout, when I scream, when I talk, people will listen. Lord, enlarge my territory. That's what I mean. Because here's life's formula for increase. You want to hear it? It's this. My abilities, right? My abilities plus experience, right? Plus training, plus my personality, and my, ex my appearance, plus my past, right? Plus the expectations of others is equal to my assigned territory. That's what the world's idea... Am I, am I talking to somebody? But here's what God's idea is. You want to hear this? <laughs> I want you to strike that, that formula because it doesn't work in God's book, right? That, that's the wrong formula. Unfortunately, that's the one that most of us are familiar with. So that's the one that we use. But the second formula is more powerful. It's this, my willingness and my weakness coupled with God's will and his supernatural power is expanding my territory. Amen. Oh, you didn't get excited about that. It's simple. Point number four. He chose God, God's hand. He chose God's hand. And his prayer is this, and that your hand might be with me. Here's what Jabez understood. Jabez understood that if you do not keep God first in your life, even the things that should bless you will become a source of grief. Come on, somebody. We work so hard for things in our life that we call God's blessing. But God looks at you and me and says, man, you worked for that. I didn't give that to you. We label so many things, but for God's grace. And God's like, bro, you didn't even talk to me about that thing. You didn't even ask me before you bought that car. You didn't even ask me before you bought that house. You're calling it my blessing. Come on, come on. Come on. You, you didn't even ask me before you dated that girl. You didn't approach me and say, God, is this man in your will? Like, you didn't do that. Don't call them a blessing without approaching me first. Don't consult with me. Like, my hand has to be upon you. Jabez understood that. A blessing is only a blessing as long as it points you back and keeps you close to the one who gave it. That's when a blessing is a blessing. Jesus at the center of it all. Are you making sure that in everything you do, you begin with Jesus and you end with Jesus? When blessings are an end in themselves, they cease to be a blessing and ultimately will bring grief to your life. And I pray that that will not be your case. Worship team, would you come up real quick? Be careful to enjoy God's blessing under the hand of God. Here's how Christians choose to live their life, either of two ways. You ready for this? 
In the Bible, there's a story of this prodigal son. And for those of y'all who don't know the story, there's this young man who goes up to his father and says, Father, I want my inheritance. So he says, give everything that is mine. Give my blessing to me. He takes his inheritance. He leaves his father's home. He goes away, spends all the money. He, he, he parties it out. He loses all the money. And then he has nothing left. Comes back to his father crying. Father receives him back with open arms. Here's the thing. The prodigal wanted to be blessed without the father's hand. He wanted the blessing his way. Am I talking to somebody? And there's story number two where Jabez wanted to be blessed, but he wanted the blessing under the guidance and the protection and the hand of the almighty God. And you can be rest assured that no matter what you do in life, if you resort to being under God's hand, his protection and his will over all your life, you will not be disappointed. God will never leave you astray. His plans are superior. His ways are amazing. And he will lead you and guide you in places that you have never dreamt or imagined. He has a plan in your life. And here's my last point. He chose to let go of his past. He chose to let go of his past. He said, keep me from harm so that it might not bring me pain. Ah, this is good. Hey, if there's anybody that did not receive communion today, would you lift up your hands real quick and they're going to bring it right to you. But we have communion here that we're about to start in just a few minutes. You know, when Jabez prays, here's what he's doing. He's speaking against the testimony of his name. He lets go of shame, right? And he's covered under God. And he wants to be careful. And he's saying this, keep me from harm so that it might not bring me pain. Dr. Charity here is a counselor. She's a therapist. Anybody needs therapy? Go to her. I know a lot of you do. Just kidding. She'll tell you, I majored in counseling as well, uh, and, and there's something that my professors would always uh, like, like would, would, would teach us, uh, is that hurt people have a tendency to hurt people. There's hurt people have a tendency to hurt people. Jabez didn't want that. He didn't want that. He realizes that his mama went through some kind of harm, some kind of trauma that caused the pain. And he said, Lord, I don't want to claim that over my children. I don't want to be an infliction of pain. I don't want to pass this on. Right? He said, protect me so that I don't have to go back to that person that I was, Lord. I don't want to go back to that Jabez, Lord. You saved my life. Now I'm blessed. I want to use this as an opportunity to bless everybody and not harm anybody. This was his prayer. What are you choosing today? Would you stand up to your feet with me, church? What are you praying today? What are you verbally speaking over your life and your family's life, your spouse, your husband? What are you speaking day after day over them today? What are you speaking over your job, your finances, your business, your future wife, your future husband? You know, Matthew 15 and 11 says this. It says, it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. You're defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. That's what the Bible says. Where will you be in five years? You want to know? Let let me tell you this. Talk to me for five minutes after service. Five minutes is all I need. I talk to you and I'll tell you where you'll be. Because what you're speaking, what comes out of your mouth, is oftentimes a reflection of your vision is a reflection of where you're going, your perspective. Uh, I can never find a man. Well, I'll tell you where you're going to be in five years. You're not going to have a man in five years. Because every single day, that's what you're crying about. That's what you're telling yourself, that you're not good enough. I'll never have enough money. I'll tell you where you'll be in five years. You'll be broke. I can never keep a steady job. My people, people around me are always, I'll tell you what, in five years, you're going to be that same unsteady person without a career. You'll have a job. You'll have a job, but not a career. What label does God give you? Have you ever asked God about that? Have you gone into the word to ask God, God, what is it that you give me? Would you bless me so that your word can speak over my life? You know what labels God gives me? He gives me labels such as redeemed and forgiven. He 
He gives me labels such as peace and joy and set free and victorious and city on a hill, salt and light, overcomer, friend of God, son and daughter of God, holy nation, royal priesthood, peculiar people, king and priest. That is the word of God telling me who I am. And that's the label that God gives me over and over and over again. And most of the times I let other labels cover that. I I allow other labels covering that and say, you know what? This doesn't matter. What you say matters because I want approval. I want you to nod your head at me. I want you to be okay. I want you to put a medal around me. I want you to clap for me. I want you to say, I applaud you for what you did. Because we're okay with with earthly applause that we forget about the plaudits of heaven. In Galatians 2.20, the verse that we read first, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. Here's the thing. We are not ultimately defined by our struggles. We're defined by a union with Christ. Our old self with all its labels is dead and buried. They don't apply to us anymore. We might still struggle with the same temptations and with those labels, but those temptations no longer define our identity. We are in Christ and Christ is in us, period. And that is our identity. Can somebody say amen? You have a choice to let the labels people put on you, on you to determine your destiny or you will let what God says to determine your destiny. Listen carefully. Human labels are opinion, nothing more. God's labels are truth, nothing less. Choose. Choose. Thank you for listening. We love bringing you the word on so many different platforms. We are so thankful for what God is doing in and through us. We'd love for you to subscribe so you don't miss out. And don't forget to share this message if it has blessed you.